I cannot begin any presentation without that as the beginning, as a sort of foundational piece of not only our well-being but our being. But what I want to really stress in this, uh, or the, the, the time that I have, I'd like to add as much as I can to what I heard from Roche uh, in commentary, and I'd like to say that. I'll, I'll focus on the body, but I think I might be able to bring a, a slightly different understanding of the body. But the foundation of that is, as the Sheikh said, is recognition that this body is not our body. This, this body belongs to Allah. We're the renters. And if we're good renters, in a house, for example, as a, as a, as a, as a metaphor, we take care of that house. We take care of it because we respect the owner of that house. I'm going to keep this in good shape. I'm going to keep that in good shape. I'm going to live in the house too. And I'll get to that. But one of the problems we have in the modern world is we don't even live in the house anymore. We're not present. We're not present. So a lot of what I'll talk about today and give some, hopefully some examples and some, something that you can take away with is how do, we, how do we develop our presence of being. I'll try to follow this outline somewhat. But with the time I have, I looked over between the time I made this out and today, and I realized I really don't have time to cover all those materials, but I'll try at least to make token uh, commentary of some sort on the various things that I've listed here. Um, many, many people, but my main work is with individuals who come to me and they say, well, I've got eczema. Uh, you know, I've got asthma, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. More and more, from the first time I started practicing over 40 years ago, more and more people are coming to me and they're saying things like, how do I be more present for my salah? How do I, uh, how do I feel at ease and comfort socializing with other people? This is one of the great things I see increase more and more is social anxiety. That is, people who are successful in the world, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're very active, they're very successful, quote unquote, and they come to me and they say, I really have fear of people. I, you know, I don't know what to say, and they have this anxiety that's overwhelming. Anxiety is, a, is, a, uh, is a, uh, an epidemic in the modern world. So I'm gonna talk a bit about that, and I wanna talk about my approach to, I studied the tradition, Hekma, uh, Tibbun, uh, uh, Unani Tib, the tr prophetic traditions. I also studied herb herbal medicine in the body from a very young age. So I studied the muscles in the body when I was a teenager. Um, so I have a background that you know goes way back in terms of interest of this and same as with Sheikh Rashi. Uh, so one of the things I'm gonna talk about is my approach has been to study in the modern world those things which are positive and effective commentaries on our traditions. And in other words, they under now we don't need that. But in the modern world in which we really, in the modern world people respect the medical doctor or the scientist more than they do the imam or the, or, or the priest or whatever it might be. This is the situation we're in. So one of the first things I have listed here in this uh, outline is assessing the situation. One of the basic principles in the Hikmah is to understand what the problem is in the first place. And I don't know how many times I can stress this point and we still do not get it. So I want to underline that right now. Right now, and Sheikh was, I, I know he used this paradigm inversion. And that's a good metaphor because not only are we out of balance, not only is our direction skewed, not only that pretty much totally upside down from what we're meant to be as human beings and as Muslims in Allah's creation. It's not a little thing. And what I'm saying there is what has happened in the past 100 years, 200 years, it's remarkable in our history. It's remarkable in our history, recorded history. It's remarkable even more so in our history as a human species. 
We do not live in a natural manner. This is not a little fact. It's not a little point. We cannot, I don't believe that we fathom and we take in the implications of what that is. In our times, one of the things, and I, I really, I'm hoping, the material that's been presented and the material that I'm sure that you will present, Uma, this material, if all of you, if any of you, look at it seriously, reflect on it, return to it, and implement it, your lives will change, inshallah. And Allah designed us, in us, is this thing, Allah gave us this impulse to move forward and to discover and to learn. The Prophet said, seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. And what did he mean by that? He meant this, what he designed it is to take place, which is to discover, to learn, and to perfect ourselves and polish ourselves and become what Allah designed us to be potentially. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, for those who give out from what Allah gave them. What did he give us? You know, he gave us so much. I've seen, I have the patients to come to me for years and I've seen people, I've treated drug addicts. I've treated treat people who are so depressed they can't function in the world whatsoever. I've treated shayukh, who are scholars, went out in the world, successful millionaires, all sorts of people, and they all have one thing in common. Wallahi, we underestimate what Allah gave us as possibilities. Every single one of, them, of, of you here, every single one of us, because I include myself, what we're capable of was demonstrated by the Prophet Sallallahu when he changed the face of the world in his lifetime. One man. We're not him, yes. And, but we can aspire to what he did. So the more, most important thing, you see, my, my teacher, Takiyodin, he said, you know, if you tell people things they already know, they'll call you brilliant. <laughs> the issue is, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we change it? So before we're finished, I hope I can give you some strategies, but I really, really will emphasize to take on these strategies and use them against the self. The Prophet Wasim said, our biggest enemy is the one between our, between our rib cage, ourselves. So a lot of what I do in my work is really it's motivational speaking, to be honest. Kind of an Islamic Tony Robbins or something. <laughs> Oprah Winfrey, I don't <laughs> But don't underestimate Oprah. When she said make a list of five things you're thankful for, right? Every day. That's that's wisdom. That's hikma. So so the, 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 the problem, we have to successfully recognize it and identify it. What's happened to us? Um, a very dear friend of mine was a psychologist. She wrote a book called When Technology Wounds. When technology wounds, creates a wound. When technology wounds. And the thing about people say, well, yes, we had more severe trauma back at the time when Genghis Khan was marauding and all these things happened and terrible wars and all sorts of things. So, you know, what are we going on about trauma in the modern age? Trauma has become especially of mine in the past, uh, say, 10, 12 years, something like that. Because we're all suffering from trauma. Trauma means wound. And we're all wounded, or that is, we, we, under, we undergo uh, impacts for our well-being and our wholeness of our being. And we either recover easily, or we don't recover from these things. In the modern era, we do not realize, it's like this, you all know the story of the frog in the water? People know that, right? You know that when the fog, you put a frog in cold water and you heat it up and it'll cook. You throw a frog into hot water and it'll jump out. We generationally have gone through these stages in which we accept what's taking place. And our younger generations, no, they, they don't know anything other than this. The computers and the cell phones. They don't know anything. To, to them, it's the natural, it's, this is the life. I didn't see it. When I was, when I, when I was born, there wasn't even international air travel. There was no television. So on. So these changes that have happened little by little by little by little, when we don't recognize how much out of balance it little by little takes us until we're not only off track 
we're totally upside down in terms of what's worthwhile, what's valuable for us as human beings. So before I go any, through any of these details here, I want to stress this now, and I'll stress it again and again. You, we, can do this. We can change our constitution, we can change our body shape, we can change our personalities. People say, well, you cannot change your personality. This is the biggest lie that we can ever speak. This is what Islam is about. Prophet Sallallahu said, Islam is about good character, changing our character, change our style of being. Well, I'm an introvert, and you know, now I'm reading books saying, yeah, it's good, introverts have their place. And yes, that, that's quality of being. You know, the, 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 the Abu Bakr uh, was not saying to Sayyidina Ali, different character styles, I don't know, or Sayyidina Omar, different, different personalities, but nevertheless, they were active people in the world. They were socially engaged people. One shaykh said the flood in the time of Noah was a flood of water, and the flood in our time is separation between us. So this one particular fact is something, if we take this away and we recognize it as a phenomena that is feeding into so much, it's not our way as Muslims. Our way as Muslims is coming together. Juma, but beyond Juma, community, shura, reflection. Our bodies do not work. Our livers do not work. Our digestive system does not work. Our elimination does not work if we don't have each other there for us. In New Mexico, I love to go to the post office because I can see people like, you know, they're familiar faces. Yeah, it's getting kind of starting to get cold now. Yeah, but, you know, it's kind of dry today, but sky's clear, that means it's going to be really cold tomorrow. The cows are lying down, that means it's going to be cold. This small talk is so much more than small talk. It's connecting with each other. It's getting things from each other that we don't even recognize from our intellects. Because our intellects are limited. Very limited. Our being is vast. Our capabilities for being is vast. Are you with me? So, uh, some of the things I want to make commentary on some of the, the few things that I've had time to be here for, for this shot. Um, but that first, that first thing of realizing we didn't sit in chairs, back to what you referred to, we didn't sit in chairs for most of our history in most cultures. You know, we did not sit in chairs. The chairs, and I'm always giving this example, uh, you know, is that the chair, what it does, that's a pretty typical posture, isn't it? But look what it does. It creates this. And in time, that's what I'll look like. <laughs> that's what'll happen. Or I could be upright. Prophet Sallallahu he said. And the hadith that we, we and I'll, I'll go more into this about one third food, one third water, meaning one third empty, or for air, depending on how you want to interpret that. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the first part of the hadith I stress, as you had in the last part of your lecture, I stress the first part. What's the first part of that hadith in many of the transmissions? About one third food, what's the first part of it? Someone? The worst, the, worst, the worst thing you can fill is the worst vessel is the stomach of the human Yeah, well another one is the son, the son of Adam. The son of Adam only needs enough to keep his back straight. That's the first part of that. And, then, and therefore, he fills his stomach one-third full and one-third empty. This was our tradition. One of the great dilemmas we have right now. I'm saying we have to begin to recognize the implications of this modern life. I'm not saying we go back to horse and buggies or riding donkeys, although it's a good idea. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's hard to do in the modern world. Well, I can't make my living. This is the world. We have to accept it. Are you just a Luddite? The Luddites were these people in, in England when the, the uh, 
Industrial Revolution came in, they objected to it, not because they would lose their jobs, but because they knew that the fabric of society would be wrecked. They knew that. And a lot of those were, they were exiled, and a lot of them were exiled, and they went to East Africa and became Muslims, pirates. <laughs> so we have to realize what it means to drive on what my, my son, my son at one point called these uh, metal isolation pods. You know the metal isolation pods? I mean, I mean, we love them on one hand. I mean, I really enjoyed that. I drove in driving a Maserati one time that it would change gears. I mean, even at 60 miles an hour, it still screech a little bit. They're fun, but those are toys. In some sense. It's hard to hear this. Hard to accept. We do not need them. We can get from point to A to point B more quickly, but it takes us away from people we care about. Easily to. So anyway, that's just one piece. The power lines. The implications of artificial light as opposed to the circadian rhythms of day and night. If we, have, if we find ourselves in getting into harmony in our bodies, we'll wake up before fudging. Our nervous system will, boom. We have inner clocks. And those inner clocks, by love's design, are designed to work with our hormonal systems, with the digestive systems, if you will. So all these functions that take place inside this body. So there's so much I would like to uh, cover and, 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 and give you that I hope mostly would be inspiration for change. Um, but a lot of places in these bodies, we're renters. Our rent is ibadah to worship Allah, to praise Him, and to recognize the awesomeness of what this whole thing of being in this period of time. We don't live for being in our bodies. That's not the goal. It's, it's this longer goal beyond that. But Allah placed us. He put our spirit. One, one of the poets said, the spirit, she said, the spirit likes to dress up in this funny thing with ten fingers and ten toes. These funny things that we walk around in. These odd vehicles. These odd places that our spirit lives. And how does our spirit, back to what the Shaykh was saying, how does our spirit live in harmony in these? One of the principles that I listed right away, early on here, is <clears throat> as is the body, so is the self. I'm going to have a hard time following this, to be honest. Um, now this is, think about this, and if you don't quite get it, reflect on it at least, or you know, contact me, email me, or whatever. We can talk more about it. And as is the body, so is the self. So in terms of our bodies, back to what we were talking about uh, earlier about exercise, one of the hikmas I have at the end of this, Outline. I've had basic hikmas, and I, I do this, I call them headline hikmas. Because these are the things, you can take these principles, principles, you can take these principles away and reflect on them and begin to see how they are true or not true, if that's the case, I think they're true. As is the body, so is the self. One of, the, one of these basic things that people don't seem to recognize is that the depressed person it's a breathing. Depressed people are not breathing. Even if they're using medications, and in fact the medication stops them from breathing even more. So they're depressed and so the breathing is this much. They're still. And as a result, the body is still. There's no lymphatic flow. There's no circulation. There's less, circulation, less oxygen in the blood that enlivens nerves and awakenedness and bring presence. It brings presence. So that Adam only means enough to keep his back straight. And the Prophet said, those of you in the front ranks of the Salah, sit upright so the ones behind you will follow suit. And it hurts me when I go to the Juma and someone's shouting, shouting, shouting and everybody's pretending to be awake and they're all slumped over. Upright. In the English language and in the Arabic language, it's shot through with somatic, that is bodily references to be an upright person. 
to be able to stand on your own two feet, to carry your own weight, right? I could go on and on and on. So as is the body, so is the self. We take on and we experience things and we embody them. Imam al-Tirmidhi, he said our beliefs, our iman, our principles of beliefs, what we believe in as Muslims, he said we're not, it's not fully operative until we embody them. Traditionally in Islam, we did not separate the mind and the body. And, and with all due respect, you know, mind, body, we we're already separating it here, aren't we? Because we're trying to bring it back together. Prophet Sallallahu said, in the body there's an organ, and when that organ is sound, the body is sound. So on one hand, he's sent, pointing to the centrality of the heart, you could say the core of our being, or this organ. On the other hand, he's indicating the, 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 the extraordinary kind of connection, the unity, that's there, the wholeness of that. Health, right? Healing. Healthy lifestyle, health. The word health in English comes from the word whole, to be whole. This is, I make a mention of systems theory. I hope some of you must, people know, everybody, I see heads nodding. Up. I've been to other groups and I say systems theory, and they say, what? Systems theory is this principle that all parts. There's a word in English which nobody uses, it's called simultagnosia. Simultagnosia. It means the inability to see component pieces as a part of a whole. We have in the model, in our model of the understanding of Tawheed, a, 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 a template already for understanding wholeness and the interrelatedness of parts in a whole. When we say, you know, we want, when we talk about health, all of that has to be integrating all these different aspects of ourselves, which are immense, the different aspects. In our bodies right now, taking place at this moment, for you who are studying physiology and medicine, you know this, but I'm going to remind you anyway. At this moment, there's not a thousand processes going on, or a million, not even probably a trillion or quadrillion. There are innumerable processes taking place at this moment by Allah's command, and only that balance and command sustains us in life. He is al hayu al qayyum So that's going on right now. This is the awesomeness. To wake up to the awesomeness, one of my teachers said, he said, you know, if we could take three steps with total awareness, we'd probably have some kind of extraordinary arrival. We'd probably feel, subhanAllah, Allah, 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 to such a depth that we'd be transformed. Three steps of full awareness. Because the Prophet says, mankind is asleep, and then he dies, he wakes up. <coughs> and some people added to that, said, die before you die. That was wake up. So how do we wake up? How do we begin to recognize the obstacle and the circumstances that we're dealing with? We do, we're, not, we're not able to face it. You know, the, the great Sheikh from England, Sheikh Zubair, you guys, I, you know what we're referring to. Because not everybody gets this when they say, you all know who I'm talking about when I say Sheikh Zubair? You know the B and the P in Arabic? And they said, to be or not to be? That is the question. Hmm? Sheikh Zubair. And then he went to say, is it nobler to stand in the face of the slings and arrows of life? Or to be, or, or not stand. Standing in the face of the slings and arrows means we stand in the face of all this that's happened to us. We come in pure by Allah's design. We even come in in the new moderate studies with children who are very, very young. Events. We're built into us is this natural inclination for uh, altruism and a kind of essential morality that's built into us. All of Allah's creatures are designed with that. The, you know, the, the lions. The tigers, you know, the zebra, they don't have to learn how to have a community. They don't have to learn how to be a lion or tiger. We don't have to. We have the guidance from Quran to remind us and to bring us back. But there's a great deal that's built into us. 
So, in these years of practice medicine, people come with all kinds of problems from cancer to diabetes to whatever. And I've seen over and over and over, I've seen people, they say to me, and it becomes revealed when we do some work together, that they see this condition that I'm in, I have taken myself to that condition by my attitudes and the way I behave in this world. And I, you know, and I regret that, but I'm thankful that I've arrived at this point. I've seen people on their deathbeds or near death who said, this has been the greatest blessing of my life. But I've come to realize what I did or what I did not do. The body is made to move. By Allah, it's designed for, designed for action. It's designed for being activists. It's designed to speak out. It's designed to be together. Back to this thing. I tell you, I cannot stress it enough because it's to do this, coming together, is one of the most difficult things in the modern world. Invite people to your house. My sheikh in Morocco, he said, don't tell people about Islam, feed them. And I can tell you the stories about you know feeding people when 911 took place. You know, before that, I was inviting people to my house every two weeks. They were not Muslims. We didn't speak about Islam. We just fed them, fed them really good, good curries and, and, and uh, desi food, and Moroccan food. And, they, and so they would come. They would come. We'd have 30, 35 people pretty much regularly every two weeks. After 9/11, I got calls from people, and they said, "I came. I'm going to come to your dinner on Sunday, but." Could I come a little bit early? I'd like to talk to you about something. What do you suppose they want to talk about? <laughs> and they became Muslim. Not by telling you about Islam. And they said, most of them said, we, I was impressed, and what moved me most was the way you were all with each other. I know I'm off the topic, but this is not off the topic because this has to feed into our inspiration. What does the word inspiration mean, literally? To breathe in. That's inspiration. To breathe in is to be inspired. And to be inspired, we have to breathe in. If we're not breathing, there was a man in the, the Midwest somewhere at a high school, physical education teacher, and he went to the administration, he said, look, this is to support what you were saying, Shaykh, about the, about the exercise. Uh, he said, I'd like to try to experiment with the school and have all of the students before they even entered the building in the classrooms, they would run to the end of the field and back faster than they ran. There. They instituted it. Had, no, no one could come, come to class until they did that run down and faster back. Some of them probably went really slow to way down. But. Scores went up, behavior changed, more interest in the class, total change because they were moving. They were doing what we were designed to do. Now, the other big thing that happened, you see, besides separation with the automobiles and the technology that, that took us away from the natural circadian, natural design of us creation, the other thing that happened, we stopped moving. So that we have to do, you know, if anyone familiar with this thing, the FWPs? You know that? Anybody know that term, FWP? No? First world problems? <laughs> like, should I get a Sony or a Samsung? Could I get an iPhone, right? I mean, it's, you know, what kind of exercise do I do? What gym do I go to? What kind of gym equipment do I do? These are first world problems. If we went back in time, thousand years or even more, world, this world would be so unbelievable to the people of that time. One writer that I was, uh, has had a lot of interesting things write about nutrition and, and neurology, the body, the, the nervous system. He was saying those people would have a very diff difficult time understanding diabetes, Alzheimer's, these chronic degenerative diseases that we're dealing with now. The concept would be hard for them to grasp. It used to be we could balance our our bodies and our systems very easily. But then, and for most of our history, most of our history, we live in Allah's creation. The Prophet said, he rode donkeys, he rode horses, he rode camels, he walked, and he carried wood. He carried wood, and when someone, when the companions offered to take it, he said, no, he would not let them take it. He carried the wood. 
We do not live physically in the world anymore. I see people drive from one shop to another shop and it's 50, feet, 50 yards away. So the chairs, the electric lights, even the electric heat and the air conditioning. I have friends in California, and I was there for a great, a great uh, heat wave, and he said, no, I never used the uh, AC in the car. And I thought, wow, that's, that's something he said. To that. Now, now we can have gentle, you know, obviously common sense means to deal with that. Cool buildings, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the implications of the modern world we've not grasped in terms of what it's done to us collectively and personally. And until we see that, I don't believe we can undertake a full and complete genuine move towards wholeness. There are movements amongst the Muslim community to develop communities. This is the way we were designed to live. This has been the way you know, in fact, in terms of the modern world, the anthropologists, whether they've got this right or not, you know, they say if you were to strike, if you were to draw a line, it was the length of a football field, 100 yards, and you were to mark off on that the length of the period of time that we're other than hunters and gatherers. Anybody know this? This kind of, uh, you know this. Those guys over there. <laughs> if we were to mark off on that football field, the, the length of time when we had something we were something other than hunter gatherers that means something other than the time we were created and growing grains and had farming and had the fences that were needed for farming above all, all the modern that aspect how big would that would that line be where would that fall on that hundred in terms of the present time in terms of our own I could say the anthropologists may not have this right but they may have it right also the point is that what's the point the point is that the meaning of it is the point how how big of a Marker would that be? Anyone? Guess. Probably over the, over the 99 yard line. Yeah, it's modern. The modern times, other than hunter gatherers, would be about three quarters of an inch in that in that line. Now, a lot of you know, because we don't have history for them, and we know that the prophet sent sent uh, messengers to every community. We know that. So many hundred thousand plus of them. So what came through them and the guidance that came, well, we, don't, we don't really know that story completely. But the point is, it's upside down. It's for, and so what do we do to get, get it right? I mean, we can do our little thing and change ourselves, and we can change ourselves pretty dramatically. But the, one of the most difficult things that we have to do, you know, the, the lion has a pride. A great term that they use for that natural pattern. The baboons, when I was at UC Berkeley in the film department, the biggest selling film in the documentary series was this thing called Baboon Social Behavior. And they studied the baboons. The baboons had some incredibly detailed kind of pattern. You know, what this one from that family does, what this one from that family does. If it's this age, they can sit there, but they can't sit there. This one does that. All the, the elders were respected. There's a whole elaborate. And how did they, did, did they read that in the book of anthropology? Or by watching the film? Allah built it into them. We were designed to be in communities. And we do not have communities. People invite me. They say, could you come to our community and give a talk? And I said, well, what community are you talking about? Is this the group of people that gets together in Joma? And maybe see some of them see you only see each other ever eat. Is that the community you mean? This is serious. And it's not something we change overnight. Although my wife from the UK, before she came to this country, she lived in the oldest co-housing community in England. Co-housing community is a group of people who build and buy houses together. They have a common room, could be a masjid, and they have houses that are separate and individual. They can stay in their house and take as much privacy and time alone, but they also come together periodically. And they take part in the, the social common grounds. So when I was in Pakistan, Ibrahim Gawani, he said, what the, was he a sugar baron, I think? Yeah, right? Gawani sugar. Gawani sugar. I mean, they own sugar, I think, all of Pakistan and a great deal of India. Very wealthy man, and he invited me to dinner one time. And I thought, wow, this is going to be interesting. I wonder how he lives. So in Karachi, we went to where he was, we were having dinner. It was in an apartment building, in a big apartment in the middle of Karachi. 
I thought, what? This guy with all this wealth? He, and we went up, you know, and we had a nice apartment, big apartment, you know, on the fourth or fifth floor or something like that. And I thought, wow, what, what is he living in this apartment? For? And then he discovered this was his family. They were all members of his family in all the apartments. They had gates they chose. This was his little community that he established there. We, that's the natural way. We can sit in a cave, we can make vicar, we can do makaba, we can, we, can, we, can, we can do all sorts of spiritual practices in which we'll get some sort of miller from Allah by his generosity. But we know each other from each other. We need each other to know who we are. We need that small talk in the, in the post office. We need to be together with the ones that we have harmony and affinity with, and we need to learn how to be together with the ones that we're uncomfortable with. Do you hear what I'm saying? How do we do that? And, and how, do we, how do I convince anyone to believe that that's what we need to change? We need to invite each other to our houses for food and just eat together. We don't need to discuss this method or that method. We don't need to do any of that. Or this politics or that politics. We just need to simply eat together, see each other smile, or see each other smile. In New Mexico, the style is very much when you meet someone. I've, I've had people come and they say, these are the people are really unfriendly here, aren't they? I said, well, there's a style. And the style is, <laughs> where'd you get that name? People say to me, Archuleta, where'd you get that name? There's a wall, and then you stay, just hang on, just hold in there, accept it, and then they will. We all need each other. We all want to love and be loved. We all want to feel connected to each other. And Uman, this, right, this lack of connection, the lack of attachment from early on in the modern world is it's worse than any disease. It's deep. It's a deep trauma. Trauma is, means wound, literally. But if we cut ourselves, like you were saying, in the, 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 you know, the, we used to watch those, those duck, the films, the educational film. When we cut ourselves, all you know, the white blood cells, so these, the little cartoon things of what happens. A lot designed into us. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave my, my outline completely. <laughs> I knew it. I've, I've tried for years to make an outline to stay with it, but you know, the reality of it is, we know more about each other than semantically we're able to express. We know more about our state, and I'll get into this thing of hey, for how, how, what is our how? Knowing what that means in a deep way, and the science of that. There's a science of that, of understanding our state. But, um, now I lost what I was going to say before that. What was it? Just before I said, I'm not going to stay with this uh, outline. The white, the white blood cells. Yeah, the white blood cells, all that automatically takes place. So much, you know, intrinsically takes place from the wisdom in our body and our animal nature. Imam al-Ghazali said, as Muslims, we accept that we are animals in our nature. We do not deny our, and that's one of the differences between Islam and a lot of other spiritual practices in which we just want to be out of our bodies in kind of outer space, or whatever. Disconnected from the human, grounded experience and recognition of our animal. Imam Ghazali said, you know, uh, he, he said, we can see it as, as the rider on a horse. The rider is our sage. It's our, it's our cognitive, conscious being, and our horse is our body. And that horse, anyone who spends time to ride horses, what a great education it is to ride horses. Anybody ride horses? No. Right, I mean, horses are amazing creatures, amazing creatures. They know what you're thinking, they know what you're feeling. We know what we're feeling and thinking too. Right now, you're picking up from me not only my words and the sound, the sound, by the way, that's traveling over my body and over all the pores, they hear what I'm saying, and then across the room, and traveling on your body, you're listening to me, not only with your ears, but with your pores. And that's just the sound. There are other things that come, that we haven't even described in terms of communicable 
sensations and experiences, subtle realities. As Muslims, we believe in the subtle realities. And our history demonstrates it. And the Hakims traditionally discussed a lot of this, and they had, and when I get to homeopathy, I'll, I'll tell you why that's based in the Islamic tradition. So, I leave these things behind in everybody. I'm sorry if it's difficult. <laughs> I'd like to cover all those points, but I know I don't have enough time. So I'm going to get the most important thing. The most important thing is this traveling upstream in a world that's pouring us in this direction of more separation, of less presence in our body, and as a result, more chronic diseases, degenerative diseases, a rise in nervous system diseases and dementia. One of the Moroccans I met, he said, you know, one of the terms we use for, for the dementia is, it, he said, it's, it's those who have not taken the path and not seriously taking the path, the spiritual path. And part of the spiritual path, the most important part of the spiritual paths, in many, many uh, traditions of peoples, is keeping company. Keeping company with each other. You know, I went to Florida, and I gave a lecture, and I said, you know, don't, when I gave advice to my sheikh, don't talk to people about Islam, feed them. And went away. And about three or four months later, I went back to the same place. And uh, one of the people in the audience there, he said that, he asked a question, he had a very strong Indian accent. He said, brother, he says, I've been, we've been feeding people Adirabali breakfast every Sunday. <laughs> he says, we have 50 people coming, now what do I do? And I said, well, first of all, don't talk to them about Islam. Because his accent was almost hard to make out. <laughs> So, this task, you know, I, you know I, I'm going to jump to the end about strategies. All of the examples and the guidance that Sheikh Hashim has given you is so valuable. I wish you could, you know, I pray that we can all grasp how valuable it is. And then the second part, how do we implement it? How do we stay with it? How do we stay with it? One of the strategies I recommend is get together and create groups. One, two, three people, at least three people. Say to that, get two other people to join you say, look, I'm going to implement this program, but we're going to help each other stay with it, and we're going to check in on a regular basis. How are you doing? And do things together. Do exercise together, walk together. The problem in the modern world, you see, is we don't move. We don't have natural things to move. So we have to do exercise and go to the gym. I had one, one, one of my patients, he came to me and he said, I was, the, I was at the gym today, and he said, and I realized I was on a treadmill. I was on a treadmill, which means he was not getting anywhere. So I said, you know, go out and walk in nature. Walk and recognize that, you know, things pass you by. Or you pass by things. The smells change. The temperature change. You see things that you wouldn't see otherwise. Even when it's in a, in a kind of ghetto. Actually, it's probably really good to walk in the ghetto. My wife, when we go visit uh, uh, these communities, she says, can we go visit the ghetto? She wants to see it. Be there. So walking has been made by a lot. Ibn Sina. People know Ibn Sina? I see some nods. Of, of the Ibn Sina was the kind of Hakim of the Hakims. And he was a philosopher and a Hakim and a scholar, etc., etc., etc. And uh, in fact, his, his book, the Khanun, was the most, was a, a medical text that was used in Europe longer period of time than any other medical test, text historically. He said that walking is the best exercise. Swimming was the next one. And recitation and using the voice, singing, speaking, etc., etc. Recitation of Quran. And you mentioned Quran. The recitation of Quran, the Tajri, is an extraordinary medicine for the nervous system because of the breathing patterns that are necessitated at various times when you take a breath and when you don't take a breath. So forth. So it's 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 a development of this regulation and management of breathing. Now, breathing and depression, the lack of breathing, breathing and sensation go together. They say 
traditionally that the Prophet ﷺ was the most sentient of beings. Meaning, he, his senses were more awake. He was more present. So you mentioned this man who would stand up and you know, that was the sunnah. Sunnah was the Prophet ﷺ when he spoke to someone, he'd turn, he wouldn't just turn, he'd turn his whole being. And he was the last to leave his hand. He was present. And his presence was testified to by people who met him and who when he smiled, they would weep. That's the kind of presence he had. And you know that some people you meet have a great deal of presence and being. They're there for you. One of the great shiyo, he had a sheikh, a woman as a teacher, and, and she said about him, uh, she said about him, uh, that he was she, her, her favorite student because when he came, he brought his whole self with him. His whole being came. This is our birthright. This is our birthright as human beings, especially as Muslims in this time when this guidance we've been given is the last for this planet. This is it. We're the last community. It behoves us, that is, it's, it, it, from that, we have to heal ourselves and to be as much service to all others in His creation, all of our brothers and sisters, that is, the animals, the wolves. These are, these are our large community. We are entrusted to care for Allah's creation. It's not only this house here, it's that house out there. And we know it's the prognosis. It's not good. It's not good for the rising level of Alzheimer's and other dementias. It's not good for the rising. You know, someone was pointing out in one of these, someone I was reading, and they were saying, you know, this this epidemic of obesity, you know, this only been in the past 35 years. 40 years. It's all been recently. And there's a, there's a BBC documentary, three-part documentary. It's, it's called The Men Who Made Us Fat. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting watch. I haven't watched all of it, but I know what it's going to say. Because you know, this was not, like you said, not eating all day. It was not eating three meals a day. That was not the way. How many people I tell this to, I say, you know, I don't eat breakfast. I eat one meal a day. Mm -hmm. When I'm finished with my work, and I don't need to be active. We do not, for the most part, need food to be active. <laughs> we need our spirits to have space, to move. And we need lightness and flexibility and be alive in this body. So the traditional model has been turned upside down, totally coming down. However, we can move towards that which is natural for us. We should consider how to do that. But together, the other thing that happens with us together is that the common knowledge rises. The common, common good state rises. Good deal. It's a good deal. You understand what I'm saying? If we're all studying the same thing and we're working together, we share with others, we meet with others, we discuss it with others, and then they bring in their opinion, their critique, their, their, their point of view, and that whole point of view rises to another level. Together, in a way that it doesn't alone. And it's self-correcting by that means, like Ishtama. We have, you know, we have a consensus that happens. We're designed to do this together. And we're designed to do that not only for the, the, for the knowledge base, but just for the physical health of our nervous system. We need to feel connected. Why do you think people are so patriotic? Why do you think people join gangs? You know? Why do you think people join whatever so they can be a part of something and they've got a insignia of it? You know, I have in the back of a car, we bought a used car, and in the back of the car it has a lifetime membership for the NRA, the National Rifle Association. <laughs> and that, my wife said, we should leave it on there. I said, yes, yeah, so we're leaving it on there. <laughs> Why do you think that's okay? Because we want to be long. We want to be long. One of the great, wonderful things that I've made my shahada, you probably recognize this too, for the many of who are converts, when I made Shahada, I felt, wow, I am actually, I'm a member of the human race. <laughs> right? Isn't that kind of like, right? right? Because there are other humans out there that are human. The great, the great, the great, uh, great gift when I became Muslim was there were several. One was recognizing the vastness of the guidance and the teaching and the scholarship and all that. Past. The Western world still doesn't realize. They still don't know the, the extraordinary 
the sort of, uh, sort of huge amount of research and academic study and research and texts and studies, academic things. They don't realize how enormous that is. How the whole very principle of academic uh, veracity and you know, truth came from the Muslims mostly. You know how genuine is this research and this, you know they don't realize what's been done and what's there in the libraries. But so that was one thing. The other thing, the second great gift that I discovered was the Muslims. This one, that one, this one, that. People that first started teaching me my Islam. Very simple people sometimes that I never will forget. Teaching how to make salat. So, but they were like, you know, I don't, I don't like to use this metaphor, but they were like gold. <laughs> they were better than gold. And then the other thing was the vastness of Islam. For me as a, as a convert, to find a religion and a lot of the people I met originally stress it wasn't a religion, it's something deeper than religion. Something broader, more elemental. It was amazing to me that in that, well, well we not only learned how to pray and all that, but we also learned how to use the toilet. You know, like, what? what? <laughs> you know, what an amazing teaching this is. That it contains everything. How, you be, how to be married. How to do everything in your life. It's a whole, the whole thing. And all of these were part of the whole teaching. So when I come and get lectures very often, people will say, well, can you teach me the prophet, the medicine of the prophet? Someone said, you know, what's the tradition of Islam? They said, the, the, the prophet and all of the prophets, peace be upon them all, that came, brought a guidance and a healing for mankind. The Quran and the prophet Sallallahu are a healing. And the medicine is Islam. It's Islam. So what the shaykh was saying and referring to, you know, one of the great medicines is salah. Rakats. You know, we'll get, uh, I don't have that much time, but I'll get into some of these principles, neurological principles, when we start uh, discussing trauma. And that neurological principles are useful for us in terms of understanding this beast that we walk around in. You know, this wonderful human thing that's animal. Amongst other things, as an animal, call it a man. We're mammals, and we have the same things in common with all the mammals. When we're born, we pass through the birth canal, and we we do this movement it's called rooting. Anybody you know rooting? The rooting movement. Anybody know rooting is a particular movement the body makes. The baby, in, the newborn infant, has a natural. It's a kind of movement like this towards the breast. How does it know the breast is up there? Didn't read it. We know these things. We inherently know things. When we're in harmony with our fether. And being in harmony with our fether does not mean filling our stomachs. You know, when, when one man said he was a Muslim, he said, how many people dig their graves with their teeth? We don't need but a little bit, two morsels to keep our back straight. And our mind works better. Nowadays, more and more research is when we eat those carbohydrates and those sugars and we do that and overload it, not only does it ruin our pancreas and the insulin and all this hormonal, hormonal disturbance. Hormonal disturbance, yes, but it, it affects our emotional state. But not only that, but our thinking is not as clear. And as we get older, it breaks down. As people, not only does the body atrophy and lose but the brains get smaller unless we do very active, reflective work, meditation, reflection, thinking, studying, learning new, learning new bodily, body, what I say, body and mind coordinated things. I mean, to learn Qigong or Tai Chi, to da dancing. You know, I mean, George Washington, the first president of this country, he didn't learn, he didn't read or write until he was 17, right? He didn't read or write, and then he was, he was taught by a murderer, by, by the way. <laughs> and, and another thing we'll talk about, he was killed by his physician. You know that? Yeah. That no, anyone read the notes of George Washington's sickness and death? His physician killed him. That's 
So all of these guidance, you know, letting blood is sonna. Prophet Sallallahu let blood from this finger on a regular basis. They had an excess of blood. But you can misuse that and turn it around and lose the guidance and you, you read that. So, but also, he said the only education he had up to that time was riding horses, and apparently he was a really master of horsemen. And people would see him on his horse, and they would be, oops, they would be, they would bang their microphone. They would, <laughs> they would be, they would react. At what a noble being! You know, they can't count. These things are visible to us all the time. We know so much more about each other than what we say and what you know, they say that you know we judge people by the clothing they wear, and of the clothing they wear, they say 80% by the shoes they have on. We don't have shoes, which is great. So, uh, he, George Washington, he said he learned, everything he learned in his education was riding horses and ballroom dancing. Now, as Muslims, if you say that, well, you know, God forbid. You know, and I said that one time, and this, this guy came after my lecture and said, when you say dancing is natural for us, and dancing is good for the body, uh, he said, you don't mean my, like Michael Jackson, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but dancing is a natural, and you won't find a culture, Saudi Arabia included, right, that does not have traditionally dancing. And all traditionally, if it's, even if it's men holding hands or men with swords, <laughs> dancing, the body is designed to move. And we don't move. Being sedentary, the Shalek said, being sedentary and not being fit is probably worse than all these diseases. Now, just I'm going to, add, with all due respect, I'm going to just tweak a little thing here that I, so I sort of pet. It's not, it's not important, not important, but it's an interesting phenomenon. To say we boost our immune system, to look at health in terms of the immune system, is only a modern way of looking at it. We never used that term. We use the term vital force, ilam vital, you know, natural vitality, our life force. That came in with the advent of AIDS. Came in with a time when the immune, the ability to protect. But if you look at that language, the immune system, we don't want to be immune, we want to be alive. And the Sheikh said it, he said, how do we come back to life? How do we come back to life? That's what it's about. When we were children, we were in our bodies much more than we are now. We do some exercise. How are you for time? Which means how long from now? Twenty-five minutes. Twenty-five minutes. Okay. When we were in our we're young, we, for the most part, most of us are in our bodies. Although some children nowadays have been kind of traumatized out of their bodies. One of the great gifts that Allah gave us is the ability to disassociate, the ability to deny, to be in states of denial, is a survival mechanism. You know what I'm saying? So we have to respect that even as a Ravna from Allah, that we can just shut down, <laughs> you know. But we shut down as a community at large on the whole. When we were children and we saw something interesting, I always remember the example of this kid that saw, you know, inchworms when they go, you know, they, they, and, they, and, he, and he, he or she saw it and said, oh, look at that, look at that, jumped up and down. And then the second thing they did was what? Try to pick it up. No, <laughs> wanted to tell somebody else. Come and look at this, come and look at this. Wow, look at this. Love not this in us. This is, this is our birthright. This is who we are. It's a bit different than the animals. We have this thing up here. I mean, one of the most beautiful things for those of you who are parents, to observe the child as it slowly, and as it enters the world, first of all, in the birth, which can be a trauma, and again, that trauma is either addressed with resilience and love and connection, or not, more or less. C-sections, it's already disabled to a great degree. And there's so much I can talk about on that count, but probably don't have time, but uh, but the little by little, the child starts coming into its body, you know, just moving. What does it do first of all? It just moves everything, everywhere. Like, how come I move? I'm lying on its back. And, and then we come in and we go, hey, how are you? And we try to make a connection. 
and it's built in just to do that. If we don't make that connection, the child does not develop what uh, what uh, what even Sanya called the inner faculty of Talchayal. We, we usually translate this imagination, but it's also the ability to have other, and we learn from other, like I said earlier, we learn who we are from others. Someone asked the Prophet Sisson, how do I know if I'm a good person or not? And he said, always said, he said, ask your neighbor. Do you know? But you learn these things. We learn things that don't have, you know, semantic logic just by presence with each other. You travel with someone, even that annoying person you don't like, and you travel distance with them, you're having for dinner, not once but twice, maybe three times, and then finally you begin to see, right, this is, this is that person's style, this is his character, this is his nature. Like different kinds of animals. So, on one hand I don't do this, about this. So being in our bodies is something we have naturally. The time we left, can we do some exercise? Does everybody want to stand? Sure. So one of the things that I give as homework to all of my clients or patients, depending. I have patients and I have clients. Some of you know the difference. Right? So, are you all standing in the normal way you would stand? Yes? How many are standing with their knees locked? You didn't do this, did you, before I came? How many are standing with the knees locked? That is, as far as you can go, extended as far so they actually lock into place. Lock? Who else? Lock. That is not a natural way to stand. Children, you watch children, none of them, have, well, unless they've been, you know, they, too much has happened too soon, they will always have their knees bent. People in undeveloped countries, they're not bent, but they're not locked. So you lock them and notice what that's like. And then just simply unlock them, but don't bend them and notice the difference. Can you notice the difference? No. Something happens to the back even, doesn't it? Lock, unlock. Now, that's homework. Notice if, if, if it feels more natural, people say, well, this feels not natural for me to, to unlock my knees. That's because you've been doing it so long, you've accustomed to yourself to what is unnatural. When your laser, knees are locked, your, your legs have no sense of how much weight it's carrying around. Because it's just like propped up. It's like being propped up against the wall. You like know? Surfing. Huh? Like it's surfing. In surfing, you've got to have your knees bent. Yeah. No way you can have stance. You can't possibly. I mean, it's like, I'd like to see someone do it. It's pretty hard. <laughs> so that's, first of all, knees unlocked. Now, while your knees are locked in your shoulder, again, the other thing, shoulders, I mean, ears are meant to be above your shoulders. Arms do not fall at our sides, they fall from our backs, the scapula and the back. The natural place for our arms, but most of us have this because of computers, driving cars, sitting in chairs, all this stuff. Prophesize on these, we know about them, the chest is broad and open. In the Quran it says, in the Quran, Allah says, he expands the chest to Islam. I don't know if you refer to that. I mean, I'd like to make a lot of the references, somatic things, to Quran and Hadith. Because it's significant that he's not, not that he doesn't say in the Quran, he doesn't say he expands the chest to, to uh, better breathing. Expands the chest to Islam. So, okay, so the natural way to stand is, you don't have to force it right now because you want to be relaxed. Knees unlocked. Now, while your knees are unlocked, allow your weight to shift to the front part of your body, to the front part of your feet. And notice, now one of the things I want to kind of focus on, how much time, I don't think I have much time for the rest of the program. How much? 15 minutes for And then after? Okay. Well, one of the things I'd like to get is you have you all get to reflect on. We say kefahal, kefahal, kefahal. What do we mean by how? What do we mean by that? What is your state? People say, well, what is your heart? There's all the way, but how is a state of being? And the Prophet said in one hadith, he said that the believer goes through 2,000 how in one day. 
in the Manawa, in the Manawa in, in his in that he says at least forty. The point is, it changes and it moves. Why does it move? Because life is not static. Only a love remains. We are transitory. We're transient, transitory beings. Everything moves, and every bit of life has to it an aspect of life, of movement. It's a dynamic thing, this body. It's not static. It's not earth. We have earth elements, but we need all these other elements to keep that earth flowing and to make it vibrant and alive. Water, fluid. So, from the first get go here, notice as you put your weight forward on your toes, the overall sensation and state of your body, if you can grasp the whole kind of quality of your being, how it feels to be forward on your toe, front part of your feet, the balls and toes of your feet. And notice that, and now move, shift, let it shift back so it's on the heels primarily. And notice the change. Can you notice the change? Raise your hand if you can notice the change. This is subtle. Subtle awareness and subtle sensation is a valuable ability for us. It's a very valuable ability. Women have it better than we do. The ability to experience subtle sensation and feel sensation in the body, and we can also translate to say feeling. Feelings take place in the body. We'll get to that as well. I hope we have time. So notice the difference. So, so anybody, so, so compare the two. Forward, heels. Forward, heels. Any comments? What's the difference? What do you notice differently about those two states? What do you notice? So you move forward and you move forward. Okay, good. That's exactly. And what's it like? How does it feel to move forward? What's that like? Is that that you're going to fall? Well, that's like if you go too far. And that's a good metaphor too. <laughs> I'm going to go too fast forward. So anyone else? What different states? What's it, what's the quality of the inner being? We have we have in from a nervous system point of view we have perception. That is all the things we hear, smell, anything we take in, perceive. Then we have what they call nowadays interoception. Interoception is what happens inside in response to the world and the creation. And then we have action, response, you know, something we do in response. So what's happening in here? What's our state? What do you notice? Um, I feel like when I move forward, I feel more of like a sense of power. Like okay, when he moves forward, more of a sense of power. I feel more like I'm ready to move. Like Ready to move. It's almost intimidating how 200 pounds are just on your two little feet. <laughs> Good. There you go. Now we're getting somewhere. That's that's a good thing. Like I say, if your knees are blocked, you can't feel that way. They they give uh, you know doctors in here. You know, you give women when they get post menopause, mental, uh, mental they get the calcium supplements to build their. But that won't happen unless they feel the weight, unless the nervous system is telling them, yes, you're carrying around 150, 200 pounds. You, your bones, you know, the nervous system, if the knees are locked, or if they're walking and they're not experiencing the walking, part of experiencing the walk, people walk or do exercise with, that's just a total loss of being present with what they're doing. So, more power. So, this forward state, now this is a, this seems like a minor thing. This exercise, honestly, I tell you, it's so elemental in terms of our experience of being and being in the body. And that is, on the toes, forward is active, and on the heels is passive. Now, for our first part of our slot, our submission, first study of our system, submission, in Salah, it's just simply being there, and the center of our gravity is just a little bit in front of the middle of our feet, grounded, and we're just there. We're not going anywhere, we're not, not we're not flying, we're not, we're just there. That is an enormous and beautiful state of submission that we do over and over and over and over and over. This makes an imprint on our nervous system. Again, I like, wish we had more time, but there's a principle that's called wire together, fire together. Does anyone know that? You know, as we do something, it fires together. We do something over and over. We develop a template, a pattern. 
So, you know, if we have a pattern, every time we go out in public, we get angry and punch somebody, eventually that'll be wired into us, hardwired. So we go out and someone says, hi, how are you? And we don't want to do that. <laughs> and that's the pattern we want to change because we have inherited most of its legacy, often from our parents and our communities and the world around us, we've inherited this legacy that lives inside of us. And when we say we want Tazketo Nafs, what are we doing? We want to purify that, shed that fully and completely and successfully so that we're just standing, we're staring. We're not, we're not caught in the past and we're not, you know, kind of needful for the future and control. You know what I mean? Where in the, in the Quran says, for the ones who do Salat, um, there will be no grief, nor uh, fear. You know, and the fear is about what's out there and the grief is about what's back there. So, you know, I mean, this is the first stage of submission, not a little thing. Everything is in our being, as far as purification, as far as healing. The thing is, there's a place for medicine as well, when someone can come and say, how do I be more present as people? The example I love to give over and over, because it's such a good example from Jello and Dean Rumi, where the men are standing shoulder to shoulder, you know this one? Where they, and they're sitting there in the salat. You know? Well, they're like, they're standing in the room, and then suddenly he says, oh, I left the door open in my house. Like, and the guy says, you stupid idiot, you just broke your salat by talking. <laughs> and the third man's saying, he's a stupid idiot because he's talking to him. But the third man says, it's salat too. <laughs> so how do we develop this presence of being? And it's not just in the salat, but salat is by Allah's design, this great medicine and great practice that we wire, we fire together. Remember, look at this thing. Like I say, if someone goes out every day and punches someone, it becomes wired in Look what's wired into us. How many times? Oh, I bark. Oh, I bark. That pattern moves over and over and over. This is a template in our nervous system. We've made that movement consistently and with consciousness and awareness, probably more than anything else we've done. Walking is a big one. Walking we do also. And walking is also by Allah's design. It's this amazing healing for the nervous system. Right, left, right brain, left brain, right body, left body, moving through the world, making progress, which we want to do, built into it. If we don't make progress, like I said, the guy said, I'm on a treadmill. <laughs> okay, so, forward, active, backward, passive, right? So active and passive is something we go through states, we go through constantly in our day, normal daily experience. I speak, you listen. Active, passive. We have discussions, active, passive, active, passive. Constant, it's like a dance. That's why George Washington, we learn, we learn something to be able to do that kind of movement. You can learn it in things like capoeira and some martial arts as well, you know. Um, so then, so, so forward, active, active. Now find the middle place. Now when I did this in a group of people, well, we, I said, okay, now move to that middle spot. And then I did this and one woman said, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. And everybody looked at her and she says, oh my God, I just felt this incredible sense of peace. Just because she'd not, she'd not been aware of this thing that she, she goes through active seeking, doing active, 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 wanting, needing, and positive active as well. And passive, I can't do anything. She found this place of peace, which is right there. It should be that. We should find it. And <coughs> sensing that in our salon, this can enhance our salon. I'm here. Right? So that middle place. Now from that middle place, how much time do we have? Let's see if we can do this. Let me just, I'll try to make this brief, but do try to make note and remember this. Because this exercise can be pretty valuable. This is a grounding exercise. Grounding means we're present on the earth. Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Ard, ard. Traditionally, we looked at things in terms of earth, air, fire, and water. <coughs> Abstract thought is up there in samawati, the place where endless names are possible, endless things are possible. The fire arises there as well. And it's flickering, and it's in innumerable permutations and shapes. Professors have carried wood, right? Rode on horses, 
These are all grounding things. To do things in the world, to dig in the ground, to plant seeds, to, to pick up things and carry them. We don't do that anymore. Does any, anybody know this thing called Nat Move? This movement called Nat Move? N-A-T-M-O-V? It's really interesting. It begins with a little bit of the first world problems. It's these people that have developed movement that's natural. Instead of exercising the gym. If you go to the gym and you work with barbells or even with dumbbells, it's going to be pretty kind of rigid recipe for you. Same with yoga. I mean, yoga's wonderful. And, and if you did all of the asanas that they have in yoga, there's thousands of them. Then you get all the muscle groups working and you get a balance. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, he said the body is like a, like a tent with its central pole, the spine, right? And then the, the, the pole, the, the ropes that go out from that, the musculature that surround the skeleton. And those should be balanced. We can't, I mean, if we do this and do that, yeah, we'll get great biceps. Okay, but what about what happens from that? You know, that movement, this movement. We used to do things in the world. People who live to be very old, they don't go to the gym. They do things. <laughs> you know, I make a point of doing as many things. I, mean, I, 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 I rent right now. We rent, and I was going to ask my landlord if I could paint his house, paint the houses that we live for free. You know, because then I wouldn't have to pay a gym. <laughs> I mean, duh. I try to fix my car. I, I was underneath my car sawing that, sawing by hand the tailpipe so I could put a new muffler on it because I wanted to do that. So, I mean, this is not easy for us to do when we've grown up in situations where we pay someone to do it for us and we think, well, I don't have the time. Right? But doing things is something to think about. And doing things, I mean, the sheikh I spent time with, Faraz Khan, in Minneapolis. Anybody know him? What a wonderful community. Mashallah, what a wonderful man. I mean, he reads. He was, uh, grew up in this country, Pakistani originally, went back to Pakistan, studies as a scholar, he's an alim. And he moved to the country with his kids, and they have goats, and they have sheep, and they have chickens. And he does things, and the kids do things. And one day I went out there, and two of the little, little girls in their hijab, they were up 30 feet up in the tree, looking down, saying, Salaam alaikum. <laughs> Took a shot at them. So the Nabu people, they, they, they do things like, like climbing things. You know, climbing under things. Going out in the forest, we move in a way. And in the natural world, when we did things for ourselves, we had all kinds of movement that just not this rigid, you know, the, or with the machines even more so. With all due respect, I know, it's a natural thing to want to get the body in shape and tell and so forth. Okay, so the little time we have, let's do this exercise real quickly, if you can remember this. So standing with your knees unlocked, shoulders above your, your ears above your shoulders, not shoulders above your ears. No. <laughs> um, and notice that you know, if you bounce your legs, you do. This is an exercise in itself. Bouncing knees is something when people have social anxiety. That bouncing, like this, where they feel each downward thrust, you feel the weight of your body pushing on both feet, both feet, both feet, on the ground, on the ground, pushing, pushing, push, push. Feel your weight, feel your weight. Body has weight, body has weight, body has weight. That can boost their confidence going into a, an exam or going meeting with people, something like that. Believe me, because it grounds you. One of our great loyal, one of the great gifts from Allah is that loyal thing we call gravity. I mean, we can't imagine not having it, you know. But some people are like that. Some people, you know, in particular, you can see that in some people, you know, when they're talking, they'll, they'll, they'll often be talking like this, so they'll turn their feet sideways. Usually those people will be not very grounded. They need that balance of the arm, too much samawati. Too much fire and air. They need more earth in their being. So grounding is the first thing. You feel that, you know, that saying the, the loyal gift of that loyal thing called gravity. You know, when we're exhausted and tired and we lie down, even if it's on the floor like this, do we not go, ah, and does not gravity reach up, we could say, and embrace us to give us repose and rest. And it's always been there. Now, we stare in the negative way, In, in this, the, the bouncy knees? Yeah, they, they can't see it, so either um, maybe moving forward. Okay, so, so the bouncy knees, 
the thing is you want to get a natural rhythm for it and not rigid, but you want to, most importantly, you want to feel the weight of your body as it presses on the floor. Press, press, press. And you can even see my head moving. Now, people who are more in their bodies, they do this more naturally and rhythmically. Some people, they can't quite get the timing. But the point is to feel that your body has weight. You know this expression, he feels like, they feel like they can carry their own weight. He carries weight in this world. He can stand on his own two feet. You know, and there's other similar kind of metaphors in Arabic that relate to that. Being able to stand, uh, to be a rinjal of law, person of law. Virgil. Exactly. So, so that's, I mean, this is part of what Allah has given us and where we are. This is our law. We're, we're on the horizon, on the earth, our heads in the heaven, as Rumi said. So, bouncing knees is something you can do at any time. If you want to add breathing to it, that's another class. <laughs> like that. But, but basically feeling the weight of your body and feeling that you have a body. In that other expression in English, a person says, well, I feel like a nobody. <laughs> nobody. You know, now I really feel like I am somebody. I am somebody. So one, one, uh, one writer, he said, he said, we could say that we have bodies, but we could also see, he said, we could also say, we are bodies. This is our self. As is the body, so is the self. My teacher said, a hard body will generally be a hard person. A stiff body will be a stiff person. An overweight body will be an overweight person and all that that implies. <clears throat> and a graceful body will be a gracious person. Okay? So, this exercise, we'll go through very quickly. Let your weight now shift to the right foot. I'll go over here just. Let your weight shift to the right foot so you can really feel the weight of your body pressing on that right foot from heel to I was going to say from teal to hoe, from toe to heel. Can you feel that with your knee unlocked? Can you feel that pressure on your right foot? You don't lift your other foot necessarily. Got it? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. And notice what that feels like on the foot. <coughs> then shift to the left and notice the weight of your body on the left. Now, these are exercises of awareness. And the awareness that we're working towards is the awareness of subtle things as well as gross things. Not so obvious. And the more we enter the doorway of subtle, the more we'll discover in the realm of subtle things that we didn't know. They'll come forth. In the Quran, Allah says on that day of judgment, every part of your body will speak for you or against you. Huh? It's not a little. I, that's a pretty meaningful thing. Okay, so feel the weight on the left foot. Now move to the both where you see the, feel the weight equally. Notice what it's like to have balance on the feet, both feet. And if you do that, maybe a little bit, just get that, can help you get that sense of the weight on those, on that body, right? Now, shift your weight to the right side again. Now this time, see if you can feel in the knee, the weight of your body from the knee to your foot, right foot. Now the knee has less nerve endings and less nerves in the feet, which are just awesome, miraculous members of our body. Feel from the, the knee to the foot, can you feel that weight? Yes. The weight of the body, and the knee, and then to the foot. Yes? Got it? Mm -hmm. And to the left, same thing. Knee, foot, floor. Got it? Yes? No? Yes. yes. Then together, both knees, both feet, floor. Hmm? Okay, got it? Now, right again. Now, right hip. Knee, foot, floor. Awareness to the knee, to the hip. Knee. Okay, so as you've got that, you don't have to bend over so far. Just shift the weight so the main body weight is there. And then to the left, hip, knee, foot, floor. And then both of them together. Both hips, both knees, both feet, floor. Sense the weight of your body, the body. And then from that, can you sense that your body has weight? And then the arms, the weight of your body from the scapula in the back, hanging, probably the side, but wherever they hang, back, sides. The weight of them, and then see if you can get a sense with your knees and up that your whole body has weight from head to toe. Can you sense that? If you can sense that, and any time you can sense that, pay attention to it. 
one of the basic principles in the Hecmos is when you recognize something, let me get back to this. The word mind in English was originally a verb. To mind something. Pay, means to pay attention to something. It wasn't this thing up here in the skull. Mind meant to be mind your manners, mind your elbow, mind the step. You know, if, if I'm interested in a VW bug, I'll see VW bugs when they go off because I'm, you know, my mind is going, my attention's on that. Same with the body. We want to be present. We don't do this and all these exercises and develop presence in the body for it be, to be present in the body alone. No. We do this to accept the first command that love gave us when we were born was, okay, I'm sending your soul into this world, into this funny thing. <laughs> and to be present with it. In the present. Shall we? So that's this grounding exercise. There's many other ones, but we, uh, and we don't have time to go into them. But anything that grounds you makes you feel like my teacher said, he said, anytime you can pay attention and you notice the weight of your body or your attention can be in your feet. And nowadays we can say our mind goes through our feet, but nowadays it's even more that we say the mind of our feet is telling us. My teacher, Hakta Kyudi, he said, you know, traditionally Muslims, we think of our whole body from our toes to our fingernails. And our heart was the same. While it's located here, it also, every every, every uh, capillary even, has that blood back and forth from the heart back. So we're uh, one whole walking heart, or one whole walking uh, nervous system and sensory uh, being. And uh, she said, the Prophet was the Qur'an walking. Think of this. It was the Qur'an walking, walking, embodied in being. What an awesome, what a thing, all of it. So, uh, the, so our birthright is to be present in these bodies, to accept it. That's what this, most of this, this Jismani section I'm giving you is it's about how do we get that, how we develop. My, my teacher would say, pay attention to your feet. He also had me walking up a hill. He said, notice what it's like when you walk up a hill. And then notice what it's like when you walk down a hill. Just notice the difference in the state. This is like awareness and learning. You learn something of one that knows himself. Knows his Rab. The Prophet, sorry, said, said. So inshallah, will we break now? Sorry if I went over this.